Placebo are enduring, creative and make you feel good. Placebo's tour de force on a tired and barren music industry began in 1995. Always looking for interesting CD experiences. Very unique, very distinctive. Like all their glorious predecessors, they are inevitably a cult band. Placebo, I think, are like three imps of the perverse nagging away at the mainstream. But ten years on, it's a cult that's gone global. As far as a musical entity, most importantly, they've got great songs. They were a great little band with a great little singer. Gender-bending, hedonistic and sensationalistic, placebo are the antidote to the majority. So it does what it says on the tin, it's a placebo. Three talented and young musicians, Brian Molko, Steve Hewitt and Stefan Olsdahl, gravitated towards London during the early 90s, all for very different reasons. Brian had been desperate to escape the stuffy and rigid confines of his schooling in Luxembourg and arrived in London as a young 17-year-old to study drama. Brian is well remembered by his lecturers, Gerald Lidston and Robert Gordon at Goldsmiths College. He was very quizzical. He didn't seem to take anything on trust. I do remember that. And I remember him, uh, he was always looking a little bit bemused by the sort of college authority and the sort of rules of the drama department. He, he wasn't, I wouldn't say he was a rebel at that point, um, but he was a kind of, he struck me as a quiet subversive. He was quite subversive, uh, though he was always very charming and very pleasant and very obliging and always a twinkle in his eye. That I do remember. Steve Hewitt had taught himself to play the drums after one of the kids at Weaverham High asked him to. His stage debut was playing Fleetwood Mac's Albatross in the school assembly. A passionate drummer, he worked out of Dougie's music store, teaching others to drum and gigging with several bands before he would fortuitously answer an ad for the band Breed. I think the advert that we put up for a drummer in Athletic Palace said, um, twin genius seeks third for German tour. Simon Breed went along to a gig by the Mystic Deck Chairs to check out Steve's drumming. I first met Steve in the, I think it was the boardwalk in Manchester, and I can tell you what he was wearing as well. <laughs> I remember it distinctly. Nice pair of clogs little steel trim, um, drainpipe black jeans and white woolly socks and a big baggy Robert Smith jumper. And I think his first words to me were, let's twat them and jam. The idea was we kick off the main band and take over ourselves and start playing ourselves. And that was it. So we, we just knew straight away he, he had that kind of vivacity and vitality that he was going to fit in with us. But when he joined Breed, he, I think he had three records. There was New Model Army, Edie Brickell oh, and The Cure. That was it. And he lied through his fucking teeth. We, we were like, so you like Can, Beep Up, Early Sonic Youth, um, Noy Bouton. He's like, oh yeah, man, got them all, got them all. <laughs> Have you got any, any birthday party records? Oh yeah, man, got all the EPs, love them, love them. Never fucking even heard them. But he bluffed it and we had to kind of love him for that. Brian Molko had in fact met his soon-to-be bassist, Stefan Olsdahl, while they were both students at the American School in Luxembourg. At that time, however, the nerd and the jock rarely spoke. It wasn't until a fateful encounter on the platform of South Kensington Tube, after Stefan came to London to study guitar, that they would both realise their shared love of music and the seeds of a 10-year musical career would be sown. Ryan invited Stefan to see him play a gig that night with Steve. Stefan was so impressed he signed up as their bassist there and then. I don't necessarily re remember any point when and then we met Brian. Um, Brian was part of Steve's social crowd, connected with some of the Northwich people. Brian had been around for ages and Brian used to come to breed gigs and I see Brian quite a lot. He chose his friends carefully from what I can remember and he had a few very close friends who were also very interesting, rather different people uh, who weren't conventional in uh, students. I can remember Brian in the early days, he used to wear um, big flamboyant I am Lord Byron, Byron Brian, uh, white shirts and a long leather coat. Like 
he was clearly always going to be interested in alternative forms of performance, not in straight theatre. In his, his final piece of work in his third year, it was very much Brian's show. In other words, he was writing it, directing it, singing it, performing it. Um, and I seem to remember that nearly everybody else was a uh, support cast. Um, so he was performing that from the front. Um, and it was a pretty autobiographical piece. And one felt that he was sort of working out some public form of therapy, his upbringing, um, which made it um, fairly entertaining. At Goldsmiths, Brian developed his avant-garde personality, using his personal experiences for thought-provoking and entertaining productions in the name of art. Even now, Brian's inspiration comes from the darker side of the human condition. The motivations and intentions are simply to communicate emotion and to have an emotional effect on, on the listener and uh, basically to communicate something about the human condition. That's what makes it art. If it's not, if it doesn't communicate emotion, it doesn't say something about being a human being, then it becomes entertainment. And it's your boy bands and your Britneys and your Robbie and your Robbie Williams is of this world. Hi, Rob. <laughs> it, I mean, one of the good things about Brian, there are several good things, uh, many good things about Brian. Um, but he's very articulate about what he wanted. You kind of got a feeling um, that you were sort of talking to and meeting a person that really had a focus on what he was doing and where he wanted to go. It seemed that he was, he was also, it was very much about gender. Uh, and uh, it, it, there was a kind of tease, because I think part of the autobiographical thing with Brian always was, uh, is he or isn't he? You know, what, what sort of game is he playing about himself? And I think he was quite shrewd about that, because whenever you thought he was confessing, you suddenly realised he might have been teasing you. And I think, if, if my memory serves me right, uh, in, the, in the piece there was something about the fact that the central figure uh, is uh, a man trapped in a woman's body. It was some, something to do with that. That wasn't the whole point of the piece, but, th but that had something to do with it. And I do remember it was, uh, it was very brave. Uh, I think uh, he took his clothes off in the, in the piece. And I think that a lot of the other students at that, in that year were threatening to do that, but nobody except Brian ever dared. Brian and Steve moved into a flat in London's Camden Town, but it was less than salubrious beginnings. Uh, I can just remember one particularly cold and barren flat at the top of Camden Road um, with sort of iron windows, you know the type that you should only have in car warehouses. Brian was in one room writing his demo songs and Steve would be in the other having poached eggs. Um, I can just remember Steve living on poached eggs and he made them in a very violent way. Steve was a determined musician, not content to drum with just one band. He did stuff with K-Class, he, he's played with lots of my friends, lots of bands that I know. He always put himself out and about. He was always hungry for success, actually. Steve did have some success when he temporarily joined the Boo Radleys on their first album and subsequent tour, although the music wasn't quite to his taste as he subtly informed the fans. And Steve seemed to hate it at the same time. He loved the success, but he seemed to hate it. And at the end of every gig, he'd drop his trousers. <laughs> and he, you'd see him mooning to Boo Radley's fans. Brian graduated in 1993 with a degree in drama and theater arts. Now he was free to follow his musical ambitions full time. I think a couple of years after uh, uh, he left here, I heard that he was involved with Placebo, and I'd heard of them. So I deliberately went out and, and, and listened to, to the music, um, and you know, found it quite surprising. I, I was quite surprised by it. Um, but then, in retrospect, no, it did fit with, with, with the Brian that, that, that I remembered. Friends were now gigging on London's pub scene as Ashtray Heart, named after a Captain Beefheart song, with Steve joining them on drums in between his breed commitments. As Alan Little remembers, the band were always ambitious and dedicated. I remember um, only a few, a few weeks, months after the band started to rehearse here, um, you could just tell the way that, that especially Brian and the band, that they, they conducted themselves and you just could see that there was something there, there was a spark there, and it was gonna, they were gonna progress on to bigger and better things. Yeah, one of the, the things I noticed about the band, and especially Brian, 
um, was he's really down to earth, um, really, you know, a, a gentleman really. He, he conducted himself, whereas other bands at the time were a bit sort of stars before their time really and, you know, let you know that they were going to be famous when they probably didn't have any chance. But with Brian, he was a really nice guy, really down to earth. And it is one of those things where some people grow into being a star. You know, when you see Chris Martin, footage of him at the Falcon, you don't think he's going to end up marrying a Hollywood actress. You just think, oh, he looks a bit, a bit like a student. Um, ditto for someone like Keane, you know, you don't think, oh, he's going to sell too many records. You think, oh, bless. I bet he's going to have a nice cardigan for Christmas from his mum. But with Brian Morco, you didn't think, oh, he looks like a student, or, oh, he's going to get a nice cardigan from his mum. You just thought, wow, this guy's really short. But this guy's going to be a superstar. He just oozed greatness. I think casting my mind back um, to the rehearsal sessions that, at Sound Advice, they were paying, because they rehearsed in daytimes, because most of the bands we had here had to work to pay for the, for the time um, in the rehearsals. And um, I think they were paying about 25, 30 pound a session. Most bands that rehearse in the daytimes are, are very serious about it because they've taken the you know, the chance, they've, they're not working, they've got a flexible, you know, part-time job or something to enable them to progress their, their goal in life, really. With rehearsals going well and a name change to placebo after a drug which cannot work but you think makes you feel better, came the task of laying down a demo. I think placebo had been here for about eight months, somewhere around there. And I remember Brian coming up to me one day and said, um, Alan, we need, we need to get a demo down. So we, I remember cutting a deal with them and I think we did a, the whole 12 hour session through the night from, from 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. including all the tapes and stuff. And I think it was somewhere in the region of about 100 pounds at the time. As far as the tracks that, that were recorded here, um, I, I believe they did about a three to four track EP and definitely they recorded a version of Nancy Boy here. Yeah, as far as the recording process went, I think it was laid down in pretty much like two or three takes. Um, guide vocal, drums, bass and guitar. Uh, we just had to get the mics and get capture that moment really. Just, ca just capturing the performance, which is very important. Sometimes you can get a bit too technical and doing everything too isolated and separated and it really doesn't gel together at the end of the, at the, end of the day. But the way, you know, the way they recorded, very raw, it just captured the moment with the band. Placebo gigged relentlessly, and although they were small venues, they were proving to be a hit. And uh, I remember, you know, seeing them on a couple of occasions, and although there was only a very few people there, they were all facing the stage, they were all, they were all looking at it going, yeah, this is, you know, really good. And, um, yeah, they, they went down really well. Placebo signed their first management deal with Bad Moon in 1994. And it was no surprise after, after several months that Brian came in to me and said, uh, Alan, now we've got, a, we've got a management company now who are, who are going to take us on, and so they'll be paying for our rehearsals now from now on, which, was, which was, they were really excited about and saved them a few quid. Just after the demo was recorded in 94, Steve had to leave Placebo. Reed had been offered the support slot on Nick Cave's Let Love In tour, and it was to breed his band of eight years that he owed his loyalties. Robert Schultzberg, a friend of Stefan's and fellow Swede, was drafted in to replace Steve in time for the band's first signed gig on the cramped stage at London's Rock Garden in January 1995. I'm in in Covent Garden, in the Rock Garden, where Placebo played their first signed gig um, in, on a Thursday, actually, when it rained. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's really small in here, and so, I mean, you can't believe that Placebo ever played on a stage this size, because it's like, God, it's, it's like someone's living room. Even at that first gig, it was clear that Placebo stood apart from the Oasis and Blur wannabe bands that dominated the music scene. Placebo were making an impact. Within two or three gigs, Placebo were kind of like being talked about everywhere across London town.
1995 saw the auspicious debut release of Bruise Pristine, combining raw, naked sexual aggression with an immediacy which earned it masses of radio airplay and a hit on the indie charts. Placebo just were anachronism really because they turned up completely out of the blue and it was just a different perspective because Brian and Stefan were both sort of from Europe, it meant they weren't so concerned about the NME or what creation records were signing or anything like that. They came up with their own, their own sort of vision. I think we decided to release a single by Placebo pretty much before they played. Um, once I just after I'd shaken his hand, really, it was kind of like, yeah, we'll do a single with you. You know, I mean, you'd have to go on stage and be quite literally the worst band I've ever seen in my entire life to put me off. And um, and then we sort of went with the flow. We agreed to do a single, and and the way again their charm meant that you just agree to everything they said. You know, normally you do a seven-inch single, and obviously it belongs to one band, and so they'd have the A side and the B side. But in this case, Placebo wanted. They said, um, "We'll give you Prue's Pristine, but on the B side we want our mates to have a song on there, and their mates were called Soup." And uh, we went, "Yeah, all right." It didn't occur to us to go. But what are you talking about? Who is Soup? In Fierce Panda's case, you know, the budgets are so restricted and small that, you know, the bands have barely got enough time to actually record and mix the songs that we want them to do without me going down there and taking down bottles of champagne and stuff like that and hanging out, man. But they were very efficient, that was the key to it. It was kind of, you know, two days in and out, bish bosh, and then a dat turned up and away we went. I think in terms of the track that we actually wanted to put out, you, there was one of any five really. Um, Nancy Boy was in the set already, the 36 Degrees song was in the set already and you know, it was just a question of whatever they wanted really. Um, they said we want to record this, we gave them a bit of money and off they went. The one thing we always said to bands at that stage was give us one of your best songs because you never know what might happen tomorrow, you could get run over by a bus or you could end up re-recording the song for EMI or Virgin or something like that in six months' time in a really swanky studio. And luckily, um, it was the latter that actually happened, rather than number 13 ploughing into placebo at a bus stop on Oxford Street. Enduring image, isn't it? The management did a brilliant thing, which was um, they booked him a gig at Brixton Academy. Um, and then you actually got there and it turns out the gig was in the foyer of Brixton Academy but it just looked fantastic on the flyers and we sort of followed them around as all their little gigs and they did the water rats and the bar fly and all the little venues and, and we probably worked with them for about three months and, um, and Bruce Bistain came out and it got on the radio and then they went off and signed to Virgin and it was just a very sort of simple process really. I think we kind of got to know Brian particularly or I got to know Brian particularly and um, just sort of asked whether he fancied doing a single after, after Fierce Panda. Um, so we did, and it sort of arranged, uh, arranged the deal and the contract and uh, the studio and uh, all those sort of grown up bits. You know, if you're a record label, you have to kiss a lot of frogs before you find a prince. One of the things about Brian is he, he, he stood out as being, you know, an immensely articulate, driven individual. It was a very sort of simple decision really because there wasn't a lot of, certainly wasn't a lot of money in it from either my point of view or his point of view. But it was sort of, well if you fancy doing it let's give it a go. Um, mainly driven more I think by, by a feeling that actually this guy had a handle on what he wanted to do. The appeal of Come Home, um, I think basically what that is, is that it's so, it's, it's got this kind of sexual energy to it that, because it's so fast, I mean, they, you know, they played it on the radio um, at like half speed because um, of, of Brian's voice being so high and the, the, it being so fast and, and it was just, it kind of grabs you, it, it punches it out and it says, you know, I am here, this, you know, you are going to listen to me kind of thing and it's like, you have to, it draws you in and it, it, it's just the, the, the emotion that, that, that it shows as well, the sort of we have to have everything and we have to have it right now and, um, and I think that did appeal to a lot of people and it appealed to me. The recording, when we got to record the single, I mean, the budget was non-existent and um, I managed to blag a, I think a couple of days at a studio in um, South London called um, Blackwing and managed to get a mate of mine uh, to produce it, a guy called Paul Tipler. By the time we had it done, um, we then went to master the record that you go to a cutting suite and uh, both Brian and Stefan came. And I think it was the first time that they 
had been into a mastering suite. And we did it on vinyl and CD. And when you cut vinyl, you can also get a, an acetate. And you see the lathe going onto the, the vinyl. And it's, you know, for a band, it's quite a, a, an interesting experience. You know, that's kind of, in a way, what they, what they dream of or dare to dream of uh, at that stage in their career. It's not about, you know, oh, we're going to sell a million records, but it's actually, we've got a record. Um, and they were very sweet at that stage. I remember them, you know, sort of Brian asking whether he could keep the acetate. I mean, an acetate at that stage costs 50 quid. Um, and uh, it's just like, yeah, go. Because I could see on, on his face how proud and delighted he was at having this. Richard Smith, a leading columnist for Gay Times magazine, has interviewed Placebo several times. I first became aware of this funny little tiny band called Placebo in early 96. I was writing for Melody Maker, now defunct Music Weekly. Uh, there was a real buzz about this band. You know, this was still the stage where they were putting out singles with limited releases on small indie labels and you'd see them sort of like third on the bill and then they'd be second on the bill to some sort of like big indie band at London Astoria or whatever. Um, and they were a band that everyone was talking about. Music journalists were talking about them as well as fans and one of the main talking points initially was um, people would see this tiny figure on the stage with long hair and makeup and his high-pitched voice and people were never sure genuinely if it was a boy or a girl which is a bit of a sort of pop music cliche you know when your dad's watching Top of the Pops when you're a kid is that a boy or a girl but it was quite genuine people you know who was a very sort of androgynous figure and some people were sort of you know confused and taken aback and then angered when they realised they'd been confused by, the, by this figure. The thing about Brian and his makeup is I, I don't remember him being that over the top to begin with. I guess he might have been dabbling with a bit of foundation at the time but he certainly wasn't standing on in the middle of Camden address. I think that sort of came after. I think he started the band and he played with his sort of, you know, being a bit a John and all that but it was never really over the top. And I think after the first few records when people said he sounded a bit, you know, a bit girly, that I think it sort of started manifesting itself after that. And then by the time they were doing Brixton Academy, yeah, he was, he was a little more feminine than PJ Harvey, God bless her. Come Home was released later the same year on the Deceptive label. This gave the band their first taste of tangible success. The success of both was in part due to the relentless touring throughout the year, with bands such as Ash, Whale and Bush. During that period, we wanted to sign the band long term, but they, they were very hot at this stage, and a lot of other record labels, including Majors, etc., were chasing them. And to be honest, we weren't really in a financial position to, to match those kind of offers. So between recording the single and the single coming out, they pretty much decided that they were going to go with uh, Hot, which was uh, an imprint on Virgin EMI. But the deal with us on the, on the single was relatively straightforward. It was like, we'll do the single, if we make some money we'll split it with you, and, uh, but you will promote the single, won't you? It's like, yeah, 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 of course we'll promote the single. That's... They then signed the major deal. And Virgin EMI got them on the David Bowie tour of Europe at the same time that our single was coming out on Deceptive. David Bowie picked Placebo personally as a band supporter on his outside tour in 96 when Placebo weren't even signed. He'd somehow got hold of a demo of theirs and um, he liked what he heard and he chose them to support him on a tour when I think he was trying to re-establish himself as a cutting-edge artist after the whole Tin Machine affair. We managed to get them a slot on, I think it was The White Room at the time, a programme called The White Room. And of course, I then kind of said, hey, great, we've, you know, we've got this brilliant telly for you. And they were really up for doing it, but the logistics of doing it meant something ridiculous. Like they had to fly, come off stage in Germany with uh, David Bowie and we had to sort of get a private plane to fly them the, and, and it just got all way too complicated. Um, and he was touring for David Bowie what were fairly small intimate venues, he chose Placebo to open for him. Um, so I think to an extent Placebo 
represented the or, or had the audience or the potential for the audience then because they were still unsigned that uh, Bowie wanted to reacclimatise himself with at the time. So unfortunately, you know, from our point of view, it would have been a great way to launch the single, uh, but it just it was impossible to pull off logistically. Um, so I blame David Bowie, really. It was on the way to rehearsals for The White Room in 1996 that tensions between Robert and Brian reached crisis point and Robert was asked to leave the band. Brian and Stefan knew there was to be only one replacement and Steve, now working as a forklift truck driver after Breed had split, was recruited. Around the time of the first album, I don't think they remember this, but I went to the gig at Dingwalls um, when the single was doing really well, while well, Robert was in the band. And um, Brian very clearly was saying to me, what's Steve doing, how's it going? Will you please pass on a message? Will you please let him know? Because they, they'd sort of fallen out of contact and it was me next time I saw Steve, I told him to give Brian a ring. The original lineup that had gelled so effortlessly was now back in business. Steve had less than two weeks to learn the first album before touring 13 countries in four months. There is a discernible difference between Robert and Steve because um, Robert, although he, he, he was a good drummer, you know, he's, he's drumming away in the, in the background, but he always, to me, made it, he seemed, you could tell when you saw him, I think, that um, he was doing it because it was his job. And, and on the album, when you listen, um, you can hear that Steve is, he's got a lot of rhythm, um, he's got a lot more sort of funk and, and soul um, influences. That's his thing, Steve loves to lay down a groove, he's, he's obsessed with this idea of a big funky groove, that's, that's his whole thing. And I think they felt Robert didn't have that, or at least was a much more kind of technical, um, clinical player. Um, Placebo had a really or have a really amazing drum sound and that goes back to even when they had their first drummer on their first album with, with tracks like I Know, there's just a huge beat and it's, the drums aren't there just, just because drums are meant to be part of a band. They're there and they've got a voice and this is what was lacking in so much music, a real personality to each element of the band. Placebo were now on the fast road to fame, with the single Nancy Boy reaching number four in the charts in January 1997, and an appearance on Top of the Pops. In the early days, Steve um, appears in the Nancy Boy video with the with a towel over his head or whatever it is. And no, his face is pixelated out. And he appeared on Top of the Pops with a, a, a cloth over his head, like Prince. And that was because he was still contractually obligated um, he'd signed a deal with a band called Jaguar um, and he'd, he'd actually left them to join Placebo in effect and he'd signed for an awful lot of money. So while the men in suits behind the scenes were sorting out the cash and the payback, um, his face couldn't be used. My favourite Placebo song, I think, and it's an obvious one, but I do still really love Nancy Boy. Um, it may not be the fans' favourite, maybe because it is a bit obvious and it got them on top of the pops and the thing to say about the top of the pops track is always oh you should have heard their earlier songs of the b-sides they're much better but the impact that seeing them do nancy boy had um, when they were on top of the pops was similar i imagine to seeing mark molan or david bowie the year ended on a high with a finale gig at london's brixton academy a particularly proud moment for the band followed by the support slot on u2's pop mart tour Placebo emerged in 1995. They were the antidote to the majority, a thrilling noise amongst the tired Britpop parodies. At a time when British musical ingenuity was a dying talent, Placebo united the influences of Bowie, Susie and the Banshees, Bauhaus and Sonic Youth into a genesis which to this day remains ultimately Placebo's. It was very much a lads together casual wearing in football crowd supporting that loaded lads culture coming through placebo seemed an antidote to all that at the time it was kind of like the glory days of Britpop which is obviously a very sort of fortuitous time to be in a gu guitar band but they were making music guitar music which was very very different to all the sort of um, main Britpop bands 
It was these influences, and of looking beyond Britain and the music of the Kinks, the Beatles and the Small Faces, that set Placebo apart from the crowd. Uh, it was the, that dark music that was coming back again as something a bit more experimental, edgy, uh, romantic, androgynous, sensual, all qualities of pop music that seemed to have vanished in the Britpop period. Uh, Placebo seemed to be coming back and bringing that back with them. In 95, I mean, it were deceptive us at that stage, we just uh, released Elastica's debut album. So there was all this sort of Elastica, Oasis, Blur thing going on and pulp. Um, and, you know, I was out at gigs, you know, most nights of the week, and you would see a lot of, of kind of copy band. It was almost as though the sporty football playing kids had come and taken over our music and the alternative scene had gone mainstream, but it also got quite bland. When Placebo came along, um, they just had a different sound. Obviously, the, the vocal sounded very different to most, most other bands at the time. So they decided that, um, that they wouldn't copy anyone else as such and they would do, you know, do what they wanted to do. And that was very refreshing at the time because you, you did get a lot of and me bands. Um, I think it was the January of 1997. Um, turned on the TV and Top of the Pops was on and um, they were doing the performance of Nancy Boy and suddenly it just sort of hit me that you know it was something I'd never like something I'd never heard before it was it was just the energy of it who else was doing that kind of thing within that sort of brick pop era it was just and it was sort of a charming little song that was kind of celebrating yet being quite cynical about the gay scene as it was the lyrics to Nancy Boyd just seem to pack the essence of everything about Placebo into a perfect three-minute pop song. All the sex, all the drugs, all the sadomasochistic references. It was just sort of like a really kind of interesting, well-made record that just made you lyrically prick up your ears, as well as being really thrilling sonically. It wasn't just Placebo's influences and sound that set them apart in the Britpop era. Like Nirvana, they adopted the power trio format at a time when four or five piece bands were the norm. I think if you look at the, um, the three piece, it actually lends itself to democracy, really. I think it's kind of really hard for someone to steal the thunder. If you look back at the jam or the police and classic bands like that, they found their uniform pretty quickly. You know, the jam had their suits and the police had their blonde hair. Usually, at that stage, bands were sort of four or five piece. And the one thing that you get with a four piece, particularly, is a democracy. And that screws everything up. Very simply, democracy in bands does not work. You end up with split decisions and compromises all through it. It's something that Placebo really worked hard on, and especially when they changed drummer as well, they made a real conscious effort to sort of do group photos. And I'm sure there was a situation where sort of Brian tried to avoid you know, being caught on his own in enemy photo shoots. So with the three P's, something's going to happen that someone comes out on top. And that, you know, that was the thing with, with Placebo, it's a relatively clear decision-making process. The way they turned up was just, it was just the finished article, you know, that was kind of, there's nothing to play around with. They didn't sort of have some kind of, you know, 20-minute jazz jam at the, end of the at the end of the set. It was just like the most perfectly constructed little pop songs. And they'd obviously worked really hard at it. And I think that's the, that is the dynamics of the beast itself, whereas Oasis was this kind of mess of, you know, drummers who never spoke and compared to two people taking all the limelight. This was a completely different beast. You know, I think Brian very much had the, the vision of where he wanted to take the band. So from that point of view, it was, it was a delight to work with the three piece. Drug craze, sex dwarf, poison dwarf, um, dwarf, dwarf. <laughs> Brian's less than happy marriage with the press has led to the trading of insults over the years. I think placebo were always going to get a rough ride from the press. Um, initially, they were splashed all over the front covers to a certain extent, um, possibly in the wake of grunge, but it soon became apparent they really weren't that kind of band. 
Brian's philosophical statement that placebo bought into the whole rock and roll thing with great vigour, with the only difference being that they did it in public, is nowhere more true than in the debate over his sexuality. People were very cynical initially about what Brian was doing just because we had an immediate history of sort of pre-Britpop in the music. We had this strange character, Brett from Suede, who came along and gave out his legendary, bizarre quote, I see myself as a bisexual man who's never had a homosexual experience. When he did finally say, you know, I, I am bisexual, I think, yeah, maybe, maybe they did sort of think it was like Brett Anderson. Um, I thought Brett was always a complete fraud, um, but, you know, Bowie was a fraud, but the point was um, Bowie was a great actor in the 70s, so I was quite prepared to sort of go along with this, this myth. Um, I thought Brian was a slightly more entertaining character, um, or a much more entertaining character than Brett from Suede. He did seem fun and entertaining, though lots of other journalists had lots of problems with him because he's very, very bolshy. Brian kind of, he was always a bit of a cocky bastard. Thank you very much, Brian. Take care of yourself and your voice. Is that it? Yeah, I think so. Does nobody else have a question? You had at least seven questions for Linkin Park, and you have one for me. Oh, uh, favoritism. Okay, enjoy Sting and Phil Collins and Simply Red. I'll see you later. <laughs> Thank you. Traditionally, bands that are a bit flamboyant and bands that aren't scared to be ridiculous as placebo are don't get an easy ride. It is very easy um, to mock placebo. The music industry certainly likes putting people in boxes and I'm sure that Brian Monko's been in quite a few very nice boxes of his own. Um, but I wouldn't, re wouldn't suggest that the Brian Monko that you see publicly would necessarily be Brian Monko the man. It contributes to you being kind of um, looked upon as like a cartoon character as opposed to you know, like a serious artist, which is kind of a bit irritating, really. But um, I think it's changing. The only place that's really like that is, is Great Britain because they have a culture of very sensationalistic and tabloid journalism. I think they've really shown up some of the music press for being a lot more conservative than they thought they were. And I think they've exposed uh, quite a hypocrisy in an industry that always seemed to maintain that it advocated individuality and it advocated extremism. I think a lot of people miss the fact that placebo don't take themselves as seriously as perhaps uh, music journalists think they do. Well, there is absolutely no way that Brian can actually impress music journalists anymore. You know, he sat there in interviews telling you about his love life and his sex life and, and his drug take, intake. And once you've done that, there's, you're in a corner. I thought that if, you know, within the band, if it could get to a point where I could be either confusing or as attractive to, to men and women at the same time, then that was, then that was a positive thing. Um, because, you know, a desire and attraction, we feel, is something that is, is very, very much shades of grey and it's not black and white. And Brian's lyrics have always dealt with a sleazier and seedier side of life, and from what he said, they are mostly drawn from personal experience. Um, I think possibly even if they weren't drawn from personal experience, he would still write that kind of music anyway. For one thing, it is in a grand tradition, going back in music to um, most memorably Lou Reed's work with the Velvet Underground, songs like Waiting For My Man, Venus In Furs, dealing with um, drug addiction, sadomasochism, etc., which are all themes that recur in Placebo's work. I think that's inevitable. There was just a honeymoon period when people thought what they were doing was a you know, great and wild thing, but after a while, you know, the press moved elsewhere. I, I can't really talk about how the press behaves, but they're that classic thing, aren't they? They're big in Europe, they're huge in the rest of Europe, and they kind of don't really care, and they sell enough records. You get to a certain level, it doesn't matter what the press say. And the fact is that they just quietly got bigger and bigger. You know, when they're on the front cover of the enemy, they were probably, you know, selling out Brixton Academy, but now they're no longer on the front of the enemy, they're selling out Wembley Arena. You know, there's a, someone's winning here, and I don't think it's the enemy, and I don't think the band are bothered. I think, quite frankly, if you're in Placebo's position, you know, after ten years of being asked the same bloody questions, it's probably quite a relief. You know, it's always interesting for me uh, when I 
find or discover a band to go back and see their formative years and certainly I think you can see after the first Panda single and our single how the band were developing at that stage um, you know ha therefore you can chart their progress as to, to where they are today. Placebo, the eponymous album, was produced by Brad Wood and recorded at Westland Studios in Dublin. The ten tracks were mostly about sex. The album, released in June 1996, went on to achieve gold status. I think it was on the second album that they really seemed to be trying to break through to the mainstream. There was certainly a lot more of a, a harder, rockier feel than uh, their debut. The producers Placebo have chosen have been interesting and I think they've indicated the direction they wish to take. With or without you I'm nothing more than anything, they were just wanted success, they wanted to hang on to what they'd achieved with Nancy Boy and Steve Osborne came in and perhaps did a bit of a never mind job on it. So in the same way Nirvana were criticised for being overproduced after Nevermind came out perhaps. It did the job, it hooked the world's attention and Steve Osborne did the same for Without You I'm Nothing. Pure Morning was really where they broke out of quite a narrowly British and European area of music and created something that could cross over to MTV that would appeal to fans of the, uh, the Smashing Pumpkins and Nirvana and the like. In 1998, Without You I'm Nothing was recorded at Peter Gabriel's Real World Studios near Bath. The album is a collection of twisted love songs which deal with heartbreak and loneliness. I think that there's a lot of optimism in our record. It's, I don't think that it's as bleak as, like, say, a Joy Division record. Um, but, you know, there, there, there's a certain, yeah, a certain darkness to it. But it, it's, it's very, it, you know, it comes from, I guess, the, the blacker recesses of, of, of my emotions. All this is fuelled by a powerful new sonic identity, the result of Steve's obsessions with funk and hip-hop. I think Steve's mark on placebo, I think it's, it's very apparent in, in things like um, My Sweet Prince and um, possibly Every You, Every Me as well, because it's, you, you can totally hear um, the the sort of influences that he that he's brought to the band, like um, being influenced by the Chilies. In 2000, Placebo began work on their third album, Black Market Music, produced by Paul Corkett. It's you know sort of new musical avenues, you know, like uh, have, have come in like hip hop and a bit of industrial stuff and like dance music too. So it's kind of we're trying to just trying to spread our wings musically, and uh, so it's uh, we'll put it all into into like a rock context, rock and roll context. Black market music took everyone by surprise for the same reasons that perhaps the mainstream had turned on placebo in the first place, they turned on them again. Placebo have always set themselves up for this kind of fall really by releasing Pure Morning first off Without You I'm Nothing and then releasing Taste in Men first off black market music. They were setting the tone with songs which didn't really set the tone for the album. Um, black market music is the most extreme case with Taste in Men being a very dance orientated track, influenced almost by someone like the Chemical Brothers. We're the kind of band that sort of lives on experimentation and you know we, um, we need to be in a situation where nobody's trying to change us. The interesting thing about Placebo is whenever they came back, they always, the first single back off the new album was always this kind of like mad electronica thing, wasn't it, with sort of crunching electronic drums and you know, mad gothic beats and everyone thought, oh it's a whole, it's a whole new image and vision. Like Depeche Mode, whenever they came back with a new album, it would be like, you know, some fabulous new direction. And then, and then everyone got their albums, and it was just, it was literally that one song that sounded like that, and the rest was the same old Sonic Youth bollocks. <laughs> it was a good trick, though. So perhaps people who hadn't liked Placebo were suckered to going back in and trying the album out, and realised they hated Placebo as much as they'd ever done in the first place, for all the same reasons they had hated them. They had Justin Warfield um, from One Inch Punch on the on Spite and Malice, and so they were trying to do the sort of rap rock fusion, and um, with that, and I, and I think a lot of people felt confused. I, I think they thought, okay, um, not quite sure what to make of this, really. The fact that Placebo started to use samples made them look less and less like a rock band, perhaps, 
and less and less definable than they already were. Though the tide of opinion seemed to have turned against them in Britain, the singles and the album consolidated their success in France and the USA. Sleeping with Ghosts seemed to be more they'd gone back to making music to please themselves and making good music for the sake of it rather than trying to worry too much about where they stood in the marketplace. By the time Placebo got to Stephen with Ghosts and they brought Jim Abbas in, who had worked with Massive Attack, DJ Shadow, um, Bjork, that's a very clear indication of what Placebo wanted to achieve. They wanted to drag out the intricacies that they never managed to on Without You I'm Nothing. Simon Breed features on Sleeping With Ghosts. I'm on Protect Me From What I Want, playing the harmonica. And they gave me 200 quid and a pasta meal. So. Although Sebo had always achieved what they wanted to live, if you listen to, even going as far back as the first album, if you listen to Bionic Live and listen to that lead riff, on the album it sounds really nice, it's good. But live it's awesome, it's in your face, it's amazing. By the time they got to the fourth album, Sleeping With Ghosts, they'd managed to involve that sound actually in the process of making the album. At last they'd managed to shove that whole life package and put it on a record, which is something bands find it very hard to achieve. I think Placebo's sound has developed from album to album. I don't know if you could uh, necessarily see one coherent arc that it's been always going in this direction. They emerged with a rough edged, dark, powerful sound on the first album. They refined that to uh, possibly more commercial extent on the second album. Um, after that, black market music reacted against that to some extent and Sleeping With Ghosts contained, I think, some of their most powerful and diverse work yet. I think the one thing that's kept them going or in the public eye is the fact that they're not duplicating album after album. It's very tempting if you have some success with one album to, you know, to, to photocopy it for your next one. And I think, you know, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about Brian being quite a driven, creative person. I think the support that David Bowie gave to Placebo was hugely important, if only as a symbolic um, passing of the torch to a new generation. Placebo attracted the patronage of David Bowie when they were still unsigned. Bowie had heard their early demos and invited them to open for him on his 1995 Outside album tour. David Bowie's work with them stamped them out as a band that were artistically viable and a band that were pushing boundaries, which they were. Many of the bands who were influenced by Bowie went on to be a big influence on placebo bands like uh, Joy Division, The Banshees, Bauhaus. But for Bowie to actually give Placebo his seal of approval as uh, keepers of the torch that he'd passed on to them, um, I think was very important because none of the other bands had necessarily had Bowie himself come along and say, you're doing good work. For Placebo, getting the patronage of David Bowie, him saying he was a fan and getting to play those sort of like very prestigious um, anniversary concerts. He invited them to appear at his 50th birthday party at Madison Square Gardens where Placebo played alongside a lot of the big people who were their heroes as well, big people like The Cure and Lou Reed and uh, Frank Black of the Pixies were all on the bill which must have been overwhelming for Placebo, who at that time still quite a young, fairly unknown band. And then Bowie sang uh, T-Rex's 20th Century Boy with them at the Brit Awards, so I think his patronage was enormously important in getting Placebo to a wider audience. But not everyone shared this opinion. Must have seemed for Brian in particular, who was a big, who'd grown up listening to sort of David Bowie, Ziggy Stardust, Aladdin Sane, and whatever, must have seemed quite thrilling. Um, it, but it didn't really do them many favours in how they were perceived as um, a cool band because David Bowie by that time had become a really ridiculous figure for the music press. He wasn't cool anymore, he was always referred to as Dame David.
of Bowie, this sort of, sort of, not an elderly statesman, but a kind of dotty older aunt. And he's famous for just having particularly since, you know, even though in the 70s he was instrumental in making sort of things like Lou Reed and Iggy Pop popular, but from the 80s he was sort of famous for having really bad taste in music. It must have been nice for Brian, for, you know, his cultural weird uncle to actually just say, you're doing good, kid. To cement their burgeoning friendship, Placebo recorded a sublime version of Without You, I'm Nothing with Bowie, released as a limited edition single in August 1999. I don't know if, if to this very day, really, people have, have got the importance of Placebo doing Without You, I'm Nothing with David Bowie. But I think, I think it was an important step. I, th I think it stamped a mark of approval from Rock's hierarchy on what Placebo were doing. October 1998 saw Placebo star in the film Velvet Goldmine. I personally loved Velvet Goldmine as a film. I thought it was a great film. It did get a very mixed critical reception and possibly in the long run, in terms of uh, their acceptance in the press, it may not have done Placebo any favours. Simon Breed went to visit Steve on the set. And I was told to find Steve, I had to go up these side uh, corridors and up to another dressing room and went up and up these, all these dressing rooms until I finally found one that had his name on the door. Knocked on the door, someone opened and this bizarre looking kind of prostitute opened the door. <laughs> and I said, oh sorry, I've got the wrong room. And he looked absolutely mortified and it was because it was Steve in his velvet goldmine gear with the stack heels and stilettos and no, the stack heels, tights, full facial makeup and hideous, badly plucked cleavage. And he was mortified that I had seen him. With their second album doing well and their screen debut in the can, Placebo launched into an extensive global tour, lasting until early 2000. I've always been a great live band. I think they work well, whether it's seeing them in a small club or seeing them on a big stage at a festival or a larger venue. They can use that space. They can make the large gestures in a large venue or in an intimate surroundings the power can be close to overwhelming. Whereas in the early days when, when Robert was still in the band it was it was very much um, three separate people on the stage. Um, now basically it, it does seem to be a whole unit. You know Steve, Stefan, Brian. They just have all the ingredients of any great rock band. The guitars are extremely loud. Everything is loud, powerful, uh, almost monolithic, the guitars come at you in waves, but there's powerful melodies in there. Um, and the audience as well, that always make it a memorable show because Placebo's fans are an intense bunch. Then as, as time's gone on, Stefan has been allowed to shine suddenly and he sort of, I think I noticed that first at uh, um, Reading Festival 2000 because suddenly you had Taste of Men and there's Stefan sort of strides out with sort of um, a big black trench coat on, a big goggle glasses, and he's like stood there, you know, basically loving the feeling of the crowd. These songs that perhaps don't really jump out at you on record suddenly become enormous beasts that wrap themselves around you and you become you know, intoxicated by the placebo experience. That's what it's really, it's really about. style and by uniting a wide range of influences, Placebo were always going to attract new talent, keen to walk in their shadow. They probably have influenced bands. I've seen it, the, the mere fact that I see them on all those, you know, ads in loot or the little grotty pieces of paper gaffered to walls in rehearsal rooms, they're cited as an influence. I think the influence of Placebo took a long time to come through, but I think um, we are starting to see it now in a lot of the uh, newer bands that are emerging uh, bands like, I can see a bit of Placebo in bands like The Killers, um, The Departure, a lot of the newer bands who are embracing maybe not an exact Placebo sound, but certainly a lot of the same influences and are joining the battle that Placebo seem to be fighting single-handedly for a long time. I think that people are kind of searching for for bands which 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 are dangerous and are provocative and which you know are 
slightly more glamorous than, than bands have been before. A new wave of musicians may cite placebo as an influence, but the music industry prefers to leapfrog their contribution. You know, it's something that, that UK A&R just doesn't understand. They haven't tried to sign a band like Placebo since Placebo happened. So I think it's more the sort of the, the, the knock-on effect is probably more of an international thing. That's where, you know, if you like Placebo, then you'll absolutely worship him and the Rasmus and bands like that, you know. Ten years on, five successful albums, including a successful Greatest Hits album released in 2004. Where will Placebo go next? They want to move on. And each stage is a move on. So, um, so I think that's kept them fresh and, and young. Um, and looking back, you know, it's, it's at that stage, if someone would have said, you know, do you think the band will be around in 10 years' time? I'm not sure I would have felt that they would have still been together as a band at that stage. In the present industry, it's unbelievable that Placebo have been around for so long. And I think it's because they built their foundations on something proper. They built their foundations with real materials. They were never a trend or a passing fancy. At this stage they're not going to be rediscovered unless they split up um, or one or more of them dies and then maybe they'll be rediscovered as um, a great sort of cult band and a huge influence on things to come in the future. Um, not that I'm suggesting that any of the band should die of a drugs overdose as a career move, but um, cynically, the way that music fashion goes, that probably would be the only way that they're going to get the respect that they do undoubtedly deserve. They always struck me from day one that they were dedicated. It was it was what they wanted to do. It was you know their mission in life was to make it in the industry. And uh, in fact, the time's gone really quick, 10 years later, and here we are, um, and they're still going strong, and I'm um, not surprised at all that they're still, they're still around, and I think they'll be around for a few years yet. They've managed to find um, three people that really enjoy working together, and are friends as well as kind of working in the band. Placebo have managed to remain at a consistently high level by somehow finding that magic line where you stick to your guns enough, where you stick to your original place enough, where you believe in the same things you always believed in enough, and yet you use them in different ways each time. So you're not betraying your original intentions, but you're still moving to a new place, so everyone who was there with you in the beginning can remain interested, and they haven't heard it before. They haven't heard this way of translating this information. The fusion of, certainly in their earlier records, uh, Sonic Youth, The Cure, David Bowie. Um, it seems so obvious now, but Placebo were the ones to fuse the influence and really make them work, and also make them work in a very modern way. It didn't sound, it wasn't retro, it didn't sound like um, the 70s or the 80s, and it was at a time when a lot of these supposedly new bands around were being quite retro. If I had to sum the band up, um, looking back over the years, um, uh, just their distinction, especially with the vocal, um, the, the variation on the on the sounds that they use on the recordings and the albums, uh, the different different types of tracks from from upbeat fast tracks to to the to the laid back groove tracks that they put, they 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 covered quite a broad range under their genre of music. And I think that the fans are always waiting, you know, um, they might have got into them from Without You I'm Nothing or from um, Black Market Music or Sleeping With Ghosts or from right back at the debut. And I think really they're, they're always waiting for, you know, what are Placebo going to do next? They're not going to move a million miles away from what they're doing, they can't do because it's so much of what they are and they wouldn't sound like themselves. But I'm glad that I can't predict where Placebo are going to go next because that's what makes Placebo placebo. Only they know where they're going to go. It's always something of a milestone in the band's career when they do release the Greatest Hits album or collection of singles. You wonder, does it mean that they're about to split up and call it a day or are they embarking on the next phase of their musical journey and going to go in a completely new direction? Um, it seems apparent that placebo aren't on the verge of splitting up. They are going to carry on. Where they go next, who knows? I think in the long run what Placebo are offering 
he's possibly more subversive and more dangerous in a good way. Did the shy drama student who arrived in London in 1990 strike those he met as a potentially globally successful music frontman? I wouldn't have predicted that he would have achieved the kind of success he has already uh, because I think I thought he was too shy. I mean, there, there is, I'm sure, still a shyness to Brian, but I think he has the shyness of, of a born performer. Then my judgment is notoriously lousy. I didn't necessarily think that he was going to be huge. In fact, I had no idea. And when it happened, I was shocked. And it still freaks me out to see people dressed like him in Camden High Street. I think I suggested he sing in a much lower voice because he'd never get anywhere with that, those squeaky pipes. <laughs> but I told Michael Stipe to stop mumbling as well because that wouldn't get him anywhere. So um, I'm not one to listen to. Placebo single-handedly shook up the British music industry when it was in the death throes of Britpop. It has been a rough ride with lessons learnt, but Placebo, now a global success, are enjoying the last laugh. But they do have a good innings. I bet they've got a few front covers that people have forgotten about. Not bad for a bloke called Brian either. <laughs>